I'm Peter, and welcome back to Clearing the Lens. This video will focus on, in my opinion, one of the most integral parts of the Bond franchise, and more broadly, any movie. A soundtrack can often make or break a film. In the Bond series, you only need to look as far as The Spy Who Loved Me, or GoldenEye, to see how large of an impact a poor score can have. In this video, however, we will be looking at one of the greatest scores of the Bond franchise, John Barry's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. In 1969, the Bond franchise was at a turning point. After five films as Bond, Sean Connery quit the role, though he later came back for both an official and an unofficial Bond movie. The producers, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, hired an unknown actor as Bond, George Lazenby. They also brought in a new director, Peter Hunt, who had worked as an editor on previous Bond films. One of the few constants, however, was the composer John Barry, who was coming back for his fifth consecutive soundtrack. With all of these massive changes, Barry knew that he had to make the audience forget that they don't have Sean. What I did was to overemphasize everything that I'd done in the first few movies, just go over the top to try and make the soundtrack strong, to do Bondian beyond Bondian. Though he tried to create the most Bondian soundtrack, one integral ingredient of the Bond films is missing. Every Bond film since From Russia With Love, the second movie, has had a lyrical title song. After much deliberation, however, Barry realized that, because of the length and clunkiness of the title, We can't use an amazed secret service, you know, as, as a song title, you know, unless we're going to do it like Gilbert and Sullivan, you know. So I said, let me, let me write an instrumental for the opening. For those who don't know, this is an example of Gilbert and Sullivan's work. I am the very model of a modern major general, life information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. Barry's choice of an instrumental theme was not only revolutionary within the Bond series, but also noteworthy for being the first film to utilize a synthesizer. In his book, The Music of James Bond, John Berlinheim writes, the film's release in December 1969 marked the first time any major studio had featured the synthesizer so prominently, and at the same time fully integrated within the traditional orchestra. It wasn't just trendy, it was a groundbreaking application of electronic music that would presage decades of synthesizer use by film composers everywhere. Barry's use of the Moog synthesizer to replace guitar in the opening riff and multiple times later throughout the score gives the entire movie a unique feel and also signals a difference between this film and the previous ones, much like Lazenby's difference from Connery. The theme for On Her Majesty's Secret Service, though completely unique, is immediately recognizable as a Bond song, and one of the best ones at that. It opens with the bass line repeated on the Moog synthesizer, before the melody begins on the trombones. The trombones' entrance alters the repeated bass line which changes to harmonize with the melody. A similar bass line can be heard in the previous film, You Only Live Twice. The theme is also reminiscent, but still quite different from the original Bond theme, which Barry actively avoided recreating in this score. In fact, the one scene in which the original guitar twangy Bond theme features is in the final assault on his Gloria. Barry was against this usage, but the director, Peter Hunt, forced him to include it. Though the On Her Majesty's Secret Service theme is extremely iconic, Barry uses it sparingly. After its use in the title sequence, it disappears until Bond's escape from his Gloria, a much later scene. It is evoked many times throughout the film, however, whether in the repeated use of synths, or its march-like feel. And during its absence, Barry replaces it with yet another phenomenal theme. Though the film has an instrumental title song, it does contain an incredibly famous lyrical song, sung by the legendary Louis Armstrong. We Have All the Time in the World, written by John Barry and Hal David for this movie, is based off of the film and novel's final line. 
It is undeniably one of the strongest songs in the series. Its impact is made even greater, however, by the visuals with which it is paired. The song plays over a montage of Bond and his future wife Tracy falling in love. As John Barry says, It always works. A good melody over the right, the right scene. It's, uh, it's, it's just undeniable. To bring this melody to life, Barry brought in Louis Armstrong, who had been one of his lifelong idols. Though Armstrong, with his raspy voice, might not seem like an obvious choice, Barry recalls, I said to Kimmy Brockley, I'm trying to think who, somebody who can bring some kind of irony to that title. And I said, I think it's Louis Armstrong. And let's not go with some, you know, out and out pop person. He went for it. And he was j just quite amazing. Barry's wish for the title to be delivered with some irony comes from its need to serve as not only a straightforward love song, but also a mournful one. And it was fitting that this type of song be sung by Louis Armstrong, as he delivers not only a perfect ballad, but one which would serve as his swan song, being his final recording. The melody from We Have All the Time in the World first appears a few scenes before the montage, when Bond is driven to the hideaway of Tracy's father, Draco, the scene where Bond and Tracy's marriage is first proposed. It appears again before the montage when Tracy drives herself to her father's birthday party. This immediately establishes a connection between Tracy and this melody, which gives its later use within the lyrical song more meaning. After its prominent usage within the montage, the melody continues to feature heavily through Bond and Tracy's key moments, during their first conversation, during their barn proposal, and famously, in their honeymoon tragedy. Its repeated use throughout the entire film is what makes the final moment so poignant. As I mentioned before, though the movie starts with the classic On Her Majesty's Secret Service theme, it disappears for an hour and a half, during which it is replaced with the quiet We Have All the Time in the World melody, which suits the gentleness of this part of the movie, where the most tense situation is that Bond may be discovered breaking into an office. When the film reaches its climax, with ski chases and explosions galore, the more bombastic On Her Majesty's Secret Service reappears, demonstrating the tonal shift. When the theme resurfaces, it alerts the audience to a return to action, before We Have All the Time in the World beautifully ends the film. This score's true genius, however, comes from the intertwining of the two main themes. We have all the time in the world's association with Tracy, and thus safety and security, and On Her Majesty's Secret Service, representing the action and danger of Bond's life, makes their collisions throughout the film not only affecting, but thematically significant. There are many moments where the delicate melody of We Have All the Time in the World and the march-like beat of On Her Majesty's Secret Service combine within the same track. Whenever this mixture appears, it is when James Bond is in a seemingly dangerous situation, yet is not in immediate danger. It plays when he is kidnapped, but brought to Draco, an ally, or when he is trapped within Blofeld's lair, but safe within his disguise. This teetering balance between safety and danger truly encapsulates Bond's life. Always on the edge of death, but never succumbing to it. We have all the time in the world, and On Her Majesty's Secret Service are the two sides of Bond's life in this film but he is never living just one of them. At first, their intertwining seems like clever juxtaposition, demonstrating the stark contrast of Bond's two worlds, but upon closer inspection, it truly highlights the relationship between them. The greatest demonstration of this comes at the very end of the film. Bond holds Tracy's dead body in his arms, as we have all the time in the world plays the film out. As the credits roll, however, the music changes to the ever-familiar James Bond theme. As Bond fan and expert John Cork notes, By reprising We Have All the Time in the World, Barry helps one to understand James Bond's loss, but then the music segues into the James Bond theme. As one hears the familiar music, one comes to understand the emotional core of the character of Bond, the tragedies that created the cold, dark interior of the elegant, ruthless secret agent. John Barry's fantastic score for On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a highlight of the series and, dare I say, musical composition. It demonstrates the innovation that change can bring and still the importance of sticking to your roots. Its greatest accomplishment, however, is demonstrating the thematic weight a great film score can bring. 
on Her Majesty's Secret Service and John Barry shall be remembered and heralded as greats for years to come. Thanks for watching. Again, I'm Peter from Clearing the Lens. Do you have a Bond score you want me to cover? Let me know in the comments below. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.